Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. For today's video, I'm so excited to do another one of these unsolved case files, murder, mystery, game sort of things. If you haven't watched my other videos where I do this, basically we're just gonna play like this game and at the end I'm gonna reveal who done it. Let's get into this new case of Max Cahill. Some background information. On October 26th, the campus of a small Georgia college, Tubman University, was shocked by the murder of the newly appointed dean of the history department. He was working late in his office when the killer bludgeoned him to death with an unidentified object. Police were forced to close the case because they couldn't determine how the killer got to Max while avoiding detection by security cameras. We're going to open this up. Same as last time, they give you the bonus envelopes A, B, and C. And you just have to wait until you complete the objectives to open them. So I'm gonna put those to the side for now. Here is our case file. I'm just gonna go through everything that's in here and then like we'll go back through and talk more about each piece of information. One thing that some people may or may not like, a computer is kind of part of this. The first objective is to find out how the killer got to max and then you have to go on to their website and see if it's correct and then you can open the first envelope. Some evidence of photographs in here. This is Max, a case file inventory list, all of the things that should be included in here. Newspaper cutout is the autopsy report, evidence report, security report, the video surveillance log. Max is on the dessert menu, apparently. The police department, like facts of the case, prime suspects, everything. A map here. Ooh, we got a bigger map. The building, a witness statement. And now we got our suspects. We have Greg Grimes here, a professor. Hmm. Michael Baskin, Robert Fallon, Alex Jamison. That's everything that is included. I'm gonna go through these pictures. What is? Yeah, they give you a freaking magnifying glass. That's so funny. Okay, there must be something. Obviously, they want you to see. Trigger warning: the first picture is showing Max in his office and like. The blood and everything next picture is diane hart i'm not sure who she is yet and then we have miranda hart grimes which i'm assuming maybe she's related to this lady and then one of the suspects eddie espinoza he's kind of cute rahisha jones a professor him danny dugan here paul olsen who is the security at the university just some random things and go with my magnifying glass and then <laughs> I'll come back and I'll let you guys know if I found anything I didn't really see anything that jumped out at me I was trying to see with like his office if there was anything in either the professor's office so I'm gonna move into more of like the evidence and stuff now and try to figure out how the killer got to max dessert menu there's max in the middle and then this lady I'm pretty sure is her and then this girl their eyebrows are way too similar and to not be the same person. The Miranda girl, she had a witness statement. Yes, right here. Apparently dated Max. They were engaged before he started teaching at Yale. I saw Max several times over the past couple months as my mom was his secretary. So I suspected that these two women were related because of the last name. They would have lunch. She was the one that found Max, I'm guessing, in his office. I drove my mom to work because her car wouldn't start. Max had been working crazy hours lately as he had a huge deadline coming up and mom said he'd been skipping breakfast. So she made some of his favorite muffins to bring. That's when I saw him. He was lying face down on his desk and his head was bashed in. There was a pool of blood. It was horrifying. I thought he was hurt, but when I grabbed his hand, it was ice cold and that's when the shock hit me. We're going to read the newspaper article. The university dean found dead. According to the police department, the death occurred last night, 8.23 p.m., and was the result of blunt force trauma to the head. Police ruled the cause of death to be murder. The victim's body was found by his ex-fiancee, Miranda, and her mother. When reached for comment, Mrs. Hart said, I'm beyond shocked and saddened by this terrible tragedy. He'd been working crazy hours lately, so I tried to get him to take the night off and go to the banquet with us. I'll always regret not trying harder. The rest of the history department faculty attended a banquet in downtown Atlanta. Paul Olson states, I personally checked to make sure everything was secured in the Meacham building that night with the dean locking the main door behind me. We're not sure how the killer got to him, but we have security camera footage of all four sides of the building. 
and will be scouring the tapes for clues to find the murderer will catch whoever did this did this person come like flying in like off a different building like some spider-man or i don't even know but just some information about max he was born and raised in northup attending public schools until the age of 15 when he became a freshman at tubman university he was 15 going to university i've known max since he became a student at tubman over 14 years ago said the university president malcolm bellevue he was a phenomenal student who turned into an equally phenomenal man, professor, and newly appointed dean. The police department is working around the clock to find the killer. Detective Carl Gaynor is leading up the investigation. It's confirmed that they are questioning several suspects. Now, on the back, up top says City B. There's a new TV show called Cafe. It's being filmed at the Bean Palace, 27th and Royale. Theater renovation. Renovation of the landmark theater at 28th and Copper is underway. Sometimes if like a road is closed and the killer can't go that way guys like i should just be a detective like i'm sorry but okay maybe that don't matter this time we'll see okay then we have home improvement loans available mcda helps businesses classifieds for kids parties free use landscape rock kid connection pet and home sitter save money on repair piano lessons found a girl's bike they rode a bike art repair knife guy north up handyman the security report it was created at the request of the police to identify all potential people entering and exiting the meachin building in the preceding 24 hours leading up to the discovery of max who was found deceased in the off in his office in the southwest corner of the second floor of the building Max's office. First person reporting by campus security guard Paul Olson. He personally performs a closing check of the building every weekday between 7:10 and 7:55. His inspection includes checking all entries to the building are fully locked from the inside as well as all windows. That includes looking under desks, in closets, bathrooms, and any possible spaces a person could hide. People have routines, so anyone could see that this security does the same routine every weekday between 7 10 and 7 55 so why not go at like 8 05 mr cahill requested an exception to the rule of no individuals inside that building past eight and his request was approved by the security on september 28th he was provided a special key to the east entry door so that he can work late let himself out and lock the door behind him on the night of the murder Paul reports performing his usual inspection and saying goodnight to him in the dean's office at approximately 7.40. The two discussed a former employee who had been squatting illegally in the old storage shack. There, the two men had a brief conversation, shook hands, and Max returned into his building. Mr. Olson checked the door, was locked behind him, and walked away. This interaction is entirely captured on the Northeast security camera. The following morning, Paul reports unlocking the doors to the building at 6.15 and conducting a walkthrough of the first floor where he did not hear or see anything unusual. Here camera footage there are two external security cameras both cameras are michelson 484s with infrared night vision that send a direct feed to a remote video recording station both cameras are fully functioning for the entire 24 hours prior to the discovery and had clear visibility of every door and window of the building there are no interruptions in the view of any entry or exit to the building so this is somebody who knows how to like avoid security cameras like mm, mm, some ninja type of shit you know paul was seen entering the building at 7 16 and exiting with max at 7 45. blinds in mr cahill's office were shut the entire time of the video but the light can be seen being turned off at 8 28. neither mr cahill nor anyone else was seen entering or exiting there are two women who entered the building and discovered the body on friday morning it's weird that the security he got to the office the next morning at 6 15 he did a walkthrough of the first floor it's strange that he didn't do a walkthrough of like the entire building he does at night after police conducted their forensic investigation of the building including the k9 unit searching for hidden individuals every window in the building was manually locked from the inside the doors were all locked with no evidence of tampering we have no conceivable explanation for how someone could have entered without digging a tunnel or the teleportation machine from Star Trek. I was saying this person got to come like flying in or I don't even know. The video surveillance log that were going in and out of the building. So three more pages we're just going to go through quick. I'm just going to briefly go over them. Just some facts of the case. It just says that the police received the call from Georgia Robinson at Tubman University Security about a murdered faculty member. Time of death is 8.23 p.m. Thursday based on the victim's broken wristwatch and autopsy. Every person entering the building 24 hours before the body was found was also seen exiting the building prior to the murder. This includes all five prime suspects. So the prime suspect, Michael Baskin, he's a basketball player caught cheating by the victim. He would lose his scholarship, face suspension, be kicked off the team, and risk losing a future professional athletic 
career if reported. Gregory Grimes, current husband of the victim's ex-fiance, was jealous of the victim's relationship with his wife and heard saying he wanted to kill the victim. Alex Jameson, victim's old college roommate, had a violent outburst at the victim's office and also made threats against him. The professor, a jealous colleague of the victim, overheard by witness saying he wanted to see the victim stabbed with a knife. And then Robert Fallon, former head of Tubman Security, victim caught him living illegally in a shack on campus was also being hunted down by loan sharks didn't show for a meeting with the victims they failed to assert in a point of entry a method of escape or murder weapon evidence against all suspects is circumstantial at best so this is items found on max a white button down shirt undershirt black suit jacket leather belt and blue and red striped tie this is what's on the back here not everything on the back here is included on here so there's his dress shoes his pants his wallet lapel pin chalk holder with white chalk inside red bic pen diamond engagement ring Round diamond stone found in left breast pocket. Engravement inside. MC and MH together forever. So that is Miranda's engagement ring. So maybe Miranda brought it back to him. Set of keys with keychain. One house, one car, one office, one desk, one Meacham building. And I think all the keys are on the keychain because I figured maybe the killer took his key. Men's watch, matchbook, business card, gambling problem support group, and has letters RF written on the lower right hand side, which is, could be Robert Fallon. Business card, student athlete tutoring program, has letters MB written on the upper left hand side. Michael Baskin, the basketball player, and there's uh, addiction counseling services and letters AJ written in the red ink. Alex Jamison. Our last piece is autopsy. Six foot tall, so what, sitting down though, it don't really matter. He's in good physical shape. Blunt force trauma to the top of the head. The area where the impact occurred is caved in about 3.5 inches across and is about 3.5 inches deep. The wound is round and appears to have been made with a cylindrical shaped object. He also has a mild contusion on the left wrist. He was killed in a sitting position by a forceful strike to the head from above with a blunt round object. The angle of impact indicates a downward trajectory nearly straight down at a 90 degree angle. The damage to the skull was almost perfectly symmetrical, suggesting an impact from something cylindrical roughly the size of a softball. The impact caused extensive damage indicating that the object was considerably heavy. The killer had great strength, he was fueled by rage, and or all of the above. We're gonna move into the suspects finally. I think it started first with Professor Hodges. He has no prior military experience or combat martial arts. He owns firearms, no prior arrests or prior felonies, no outstanding warrants. I became violently ill at work and left campus at about 4 p.m. on October 26th. I arrived at my residence 4.30 and stayed there for the entire evening. I was quite sick and fell into complete exhaustion until the police woke me up around 10 a.m. Other than frequent visits to the bathroom to vomit and getting up to find the remote, I cannot recall leaving my bed all night. Individual who can confirm your whereabouts at the time of the incident. Professor Davenport, he's a colleague. I vomited all over him. So I'm curious though with seeing like the surveillance if he actually did leave at the time he said. Okay, it does say that he left at 402 the witness statement this is the professor davenport i'm a history professor here at tubman thursday afternoon i had the distinct misfortune of having tea with him in my office where he became extraordinarily ill and vomited all over me it was clear to anyone in our department that professor hodges and max were far from friends i'm not sure max had anything against this man but i can't say the same in reverse it wasn't a duel to death type of situation but there had been some long-standing resentment at, on hodge's part i remember sitting next to arthur during max's initiation ceremony when he became the dean as president bellevue attached the tubman pin on his lapel professor hodges leaned toward me and whispered too bad it's just a pin instead of a long sharp knife he's forever saying something snippy about max but he's no murderer bitter old crusty curmudgeon of a man this is the interview with the professor that's a suspect so how did you know max he was the appointed dean he also taught a couple of classes how long have you known him 14 years he was one of my students and had only been a dean a couple of months a position i was in line for but favoritism is prevalent so clearly he's a little jealous i sense a hint of resentment how very astute of you to pick up on that that position had been all but guaranteed to me then max showed interest in returning to his alma mater and here we are max was still pretentious little snot he'd always been can you elaborate on that 
Max loved to one-up people, especially me. When he was 16, he openly challenged a point I was teaching concerning the Underground Railroad. He had no business doing that. Yes, I despise the little instigator, but that certainly doesn't mean I'd stoop to murder. Move on now to Robert Fallon, previous head of security, and he's I think he's like a squatter or something now. He's divorced. He was in the Navy. He has martial arts and combat experience. He owns firearms, no prior arrests or felonies or outstanding warrants, and he's not under investigation. It says his ex-wife took both of his cars. But 823 Thursday, October 26th, I was by myself in the old storage shack located out in the woods near Dale River on the grounds of Tubman University. I had been in the shack since about 5.15 Thursday evening and stayed there all night long. There isn't anyone who can corroborate my alibi, but there are hundreds of people throughout the campus who can vouch for my character. Individuals who can confirm your whereabouts is the main security guard now, Paul Olson, can vouch for my integrity. Okay. This is the old storage shack where he is staying. He was seen on the security camera entering and exiting around the time he said. Witness statement form. This is from Paul. Around 5.30 Wednesday morning, I was making early rounds and spotted Max in a heated debate with a strange guy. I watched in case there was trouble and realized the guy looked familiar. The guy went in the shack and then Max, who'd been out jogging, came my way. I asked if that was Robert. Hard to tell as he dyed his hair black, grown out his beard, and wearing sunglasses, Max confirmed my suspicions. I worked for Robert Fallon for four years as his assistant while he was head of security. We became close. A few months ago, Robert left a note saying he was resigning immediately and moving out of state. Wasn't like him and I'd been pretty worried. I asked Max what kind of trouble he was in. He said Robert wanted to keep it private, but I told him as Robert's friend I wanted to help. He said Robert was broke from the divorce, which I already knew. His wife hooked up with a shady lawyer who took him to the cleaners. Max said Robert got involved with illegal gambling and quickly ended up owing a lot of money, and they were after him. He quit his job, disguised himself. He still had his keys and let himself into buildings to borrow stuff. There have been multiple unexplained thefts recently of locked buildings, stuff people wouldn't normally steal, like a used mattress and pillow, old blanket living necessities, food, and a small amount of cash. Max had set up a meeting with Robert scheduled for 8.15 this morning to discuss options. He couldn't keep hiding in the shack and stealing. The next morning, I was running about five minutes late for the meeting when I heard on the walkie that Max had just been found dead. I was shocked. Robert was nowhere to be seen despite our meeting scheduled. He's saying that Robert couldn't have done it. Now this is the interview of the detective with Robert. They're talking about the meeting that they were supposed to have the next morning. Paul knew about the meeting, all about it, and he showed up, but you didn't. Why is that? Was it because you already knew he was dead? You were the one who killed him? No reason to show up for a meeting with the dead guy, right? I had no idea he was dead, not till about an hour ago when your men spotted me and brought me in for questioning. Then why weren't you at the meeting? You decided that it wasn't worth the risk and I needed to find a new place to hide for a bit. These guys are after me and they're serious. They want to kill me. I didn't know if Max could keep his mouth shut, which apparently I was right. I think I get it. Max knew too much, didn't he? He knew about the illegal gambling, you were stealing stuff from the college by letting yourself in and out with the keys you still had. Things spiraled out of control, you were desperate, you panicked, and you did what you thought you had to do. I didn't kill him. Yes, I've been taking stuff. I don't think he did it. The ex fiance's husband, he doesn't have any prior military experience, but he does have martial arts and combat experience. He has a firearm and no prior arrests or felonies or warrants. He was with his friend Eddie Espinosa the entire evening, which Eddie was the guy that I said was cute. <laughs> we were at his place, then we went to the dog park near Eddie's house. We went over to Max Cahill's house. He wasn't home, then we went back to Eddie's place around 9. Was back to my house before 11, as I'm sure my wife Miranda can confirm. Eddie's witness statement, me and Greg go way back. He's got a temper, but don't most guys when they got a good reason. Greg was hanging with me the night of the murder. From around 7 to maybe 10.30, we had some beers and talked. He was still pretty riled up from the new dessert menu over at the Shea Lorraine. It's got his wife, her mom, and this Max character all having a great time together, and it doesn't look good. He went over to the school and threatened Max that morning, but he didn't mean nothing by it. He always says crazy stuff like that when he's mad. I don't think she's cheating because Greg keeps her in line real good. I think that creep Max was trying to move in on Greg's territory. Greg couldn't get that dessert menu off his mind, so I figured we had to do something to help him blow off some steam. Took a couple of plastic bags to the park and gathered up some real nasty dog crap and headed off to Max's house. There wasn't anybody home, so we snuck around the back and dumped it in his barbecue grill. Ew, that's so gross. 
I'm not really proud that we did that, but I'm sure you can inspect his grill and confirm my friend Greg had nothing to do with the murder. We went back to my place, had a couple more beers, and went home. We actually have another witness statement, which is from Diane Hart, which is technically, I guess, his mother-in-law. I can't even begin to express the devastation I feel over the loss of such a wonderful young man. I was Dean Kao's personal secretary for the past two months. I've known Mac for several years as he used to be engaged to my daughter, and the three of us would frequently have lunch together. Greg was out of his mind with jealousy when he saw that menu. Yesterday morning, I was having trouble getting my car started, and when I got to the office, I saw Greg bursting out of Max's office in a rage, screaming, you better stay away from her or else. I asked him what was wrong, and he said, you know exactly what's wrong. You don't do a th single thing to stop it. Greg's got a terrible temper, and given everything that's happened, I really don't know what to think. There were a couple times when Max's old college roommate showed up. Max said his name was Alec. He was clearly drunk. Max came out to see what was going on. The drunk man got right in his face and said something like, Hey buddy, remember me? The guy you threw under the bus? Doing pretty well for yourself. You better watch it because I learned a thing or two in the slammer about how to deal with a snitch. He showed up again yesterday when I was in Max's office going over some paperwork. He seemed sober and asked Max for money, saying it was the least he could do since Max was living the high life and he was living in a homeless shelter. Max declined and things escalated quickly. He stormed over to the liquor cabinet and smashed several bottles onto the floor. He glared at Max and said, always the snitch, aren't you? You're going to pay for what you've done to me. And then he left. The interview with Greg. Can you describe your relationship with Max? Didn't have one, never met him till he came back to town. See him a few times. When did you last see him? I don't remember, wouldn't want to. Nothing going on. Then why was your wife inconsolable when she found his body? She found him first, you know, bringing Max his favorite muffins. What a great gal you got there. Did you get any from that batch, Greg, or didn't your wife give the whole batch to Max? She makes plenty of muffins, whole batches just for me pretty much whenever I want. And you weren't going to let that muffin lover steal your wife. <laughs> this detective is funny. So you showed him who's boss, huh? Right again. But you knew he wouldn't listen because he was in love with your wife. You had to take matters into your own hands. You're a married man. Can't blame you. You did what you had to do. No, I didn't kill him. I wanted him away from her, but I didn't kill him. Aw, oh, come on. Of course you did. <laughs> I just wanted him to stay away from her. Our next suspect, Michael Baskin. He put no for military experience, no martial arts no firearms prior arrest felonies outstanding warrants he says he's at the gym with my roommate danny dugan until around 7 45 when i left to go get something to eat but wound up going back to my room instead because i didn't have any money the time of the murder i was in the room studying and fell asleep pretty early probably sometime around nine so we have max sending an email to m bellevue about michael and his academic integrity hi malcolm unfortunately this email is all business and no pleasure i'm writing to you in regards to michael baskin a junior of ours here at tubman i'm sure you know him he's captain of the basketball team and here on a scholarship he is also a student of mine in british history and i'm very sorry to report that i caught him cheating on an exam it seems he's most likely done this in the past i told him he needed to take responsibility for his grades and actions and in frustration he made a threat about wanting to take responsibility for seeing me dead it goes without saying that you're completely against cheating, as am I. Our policy states that he must be suspended and taken off the team. I also know this means he will have to forfeit his scholarship, but the integrity of this institution cannot allow this student or any student to get away with this. I know these actions will have an adverse effect on his future, and I deeply regret that. I also feel we should conduct an internal investigation to find out who, if anyone, has allowed this to go on but I'll defer to you on that matter. I would like to set up a meeting for you, myself, and Michael as soon as possible once you return on Monday. So this is a copy of the draft that Max was typing and it said it was found open on the office computer and it wasn't sent. So Michael got to him before he could send it. A witness statement, this is Danny. He says he met Michael a couple years ago when they were roommates. Last Thursday evening, Michael and I were at the campus gym. I've been working there since freshman year. I'm the assistant manager now. We had the place to ourselves after 7.15, so we decided to do a few supersets. I was going to close up early around 8.30 when we were done. Michael got lightheaded and almost passed out while doing concentration curls. I've seen this happen with him before when he hasn't eaten much, so I told him to go grab a pizza for both of us while I finished. But he ended up going back to the dorm instead because he didn't have any money on him or his student spending card. He left the weight room at about 7.45, and when I got back to the room at around quarter to nine, he was asleep in bed with a British history textbook tucked under his arm. This is the interview of the detective with Michael. They're just asking him about, like, his basketball playing so you thought you'd snuff him out before he could spill the beans what no are you kidding me are you, you think i killed him 
The dean hadn't sent it yet, so your entire motive along with the statement you made about wanting to take responsibility for his death was right there on his computer screen just waiting for us to find. Tell me, Michael, where were you last night? He said again he's at the gym. Do you know what time you got back to the gym? Thing is, I never went back. I had a big test the next day in British history and decided to cram in some studying instead. I find it pretty hard to believe that a jock who's cheating his way through college suddenly transforms into super student when he needs an alibi. You had to take out the dean so you could continue your easy ride and move on to the pros. So our last suspect, finally, this is Alex Jamison, Max's old roommate called him a snitch. He doesn't have any military experience or combat martial arts, no firearms. He does have prior arrests and felonies. During the time of the murder, I was just getting comfy at my five-star luxury accommodations at the James P. Laramick Homeless Shelter. Several other residents were aware of my presence, and I bet if you slip each one of them a cool crisp 50, they still won't give you a straight answer about it. You might want to talk to the shelter director, Rahisha Jones. She was there when I checked in around 7 p.m. And you probably won't even have to bribe her for info. Witness, which is Rahisha. I've been the director at the homeless shelter for the past three years. Alex has been staying with us for about a week now, but he's in and out many times over the years. I was at the front desk and he checked in just before 7. That's the cutoff time for the night. If they come in later, they're turned away. I assume he was there the entire evening. Even though Alex likes to stir things up, he's smart and knows if he gets caught sneaking out, he'll get kicked out. Having a bed at night is pretty good motivation for these guys. There was an incident with him later on, though. It was right before 11. Most of the guys were already asleep when he suddenly held up a bottle of expensive bourbon and loudly screamed, the croaking raven death bellow for revenge. I'm not exactly sure what it means, but it was hard to forget. I'm pretty sure it's Shakespeare. I asked him where he got in the bottle because it looked really expensive, and I knew he didn't have that kind of money. He said it was a lovely parting gift from his good friend Max. I read about that dean at the school. I just hope Alex didn't have anything to do with it. The interview. How did you know Max? We were college roommates before that little snitch decided to ruin my life. I smoked some weed and kept it stashed under my bed. Max ratted me out. So they kicked me to the curb, which was just what he wanted. Why do you say that? Max and I received a lot of attention because we were the two boy wonders. The two local boys who were both college freshmen at the age of 15. My intellect was far superior. He wanted the attention all to himself, so he set his sights on procuring me a one-way ticket to Dante's Inferno. Everything would have been fine if he kept his nose in his books and out of my business, and he's just saying he holds a grudge. He's ended up homeless. He wouldn't keep his mouth shut. I should have shut it for him a long time ago. Shut it for him now. Don't even go there. I wasn't suggesting that I do him in. So that is all of the information to do with this case it is just a matter of figuring out how this person was able to get to max in his office i think something with these maps obviously have to show which way they entered i didn't think that it would have anything to do necessarily with the suspects because i feel like if it is saying that it has something to do with michael for example then it would kind of be giving away who the killer was right away so i've been going back through the pictures and in order to open the first envelope, you have to go online and figure out two documents that show how the killer got to Mac. It had gotten one right using the map. The second part, going over every single part of these pictures, Dave Port's office here. A bookcase that is not like the rest. It's one of those, I'm guessing, that like opens up and maybe like is a secret passageway or something. So that is what ultimately how this person must have gotten in to the office and you can also see on this map here with how the bookcase goes across and then it goes back so there's pretty much like oh, i guess a whole room that this person could sit in we're gonna open up bonus envelope a okay our objective is identify the prime suspect the evidence suggests one of the five suspects lied about his alibi and used a secret tunnel to enter the building when you find the evidence that helps identify the prime suspect, visit the website to see if you got it right. The secret bookcase. This was found in the tunnel. Uh, I'm going to go in with my little magnifying glass though because there's letters. So I want to see if it spells something like the bottle. Murder weapon. Item is. It's kind of weird looking. It looked like one of these things that you like swing around. Another newspaper article. There's a secret underground railroad tunnel discovered at Tubman. Police discovered a secret tunnel that's believed to be a part of the underground railroad. They received a tip from a private investigator working the unsolved case. The secret entrance to the tunnel was found behind a bookcase in a basement office of the Meacham building. It travels about 15 feet underground and connects to a drainage pipe emptying into the Dale River. 
Not only do police believe the discovery can help an unsolved case, historians believe it may also rewrite history. When contacted for comment, Professor Emeritus Arthur Hodges, Cahill's replacement and longtime dean of the history department, was delighted at the news. This is a highly significant finding and an incredibly important discovery. The tunnel is currently considered a crime scene, but Professor Hodges is seeking immediate access for himself and a group of historians to conduct a thorough exploration of the space. It's my great hope that we will get a chance to unearth priceless historical artifacts. I'm gonna read the back as always because there's always some random stories. Additional food options coming to student union. I was just talking about a food court. There will be seating, a school council new school activities. So the Dale River is over here. I do think it's kind of convenient for Robert. He was staying in the shack. He lives right by the river. I think it's also funny though that the professor is now the dean so in a way max dying promoted him i'm just going to go back through all of the witness statements and all the suspects and see which story seems kind of far out there i just noticed that there's like a pair of gloves i didn't even see that at first i want to write down all of these letters because i'm like trying to spell out i'm just gonna get a piece of paper i got say and then I have P-C-C-I-U-F-P-O-E-R. Unless this is like a medication bottle, like what would a bottle have written on it? It's, hmm. I don't want to like cut this up in a million pieces. I'm trying to draw it myself, trace the bottle on the back here. And then I was getting here Y-O-P. I'm like, that doesn't even make sense. And then I had S-E-I-P-A-C. I flipped some things around. I got syrup. But I'm like, that looks like cough medicine, you know? Couldn't figure out though with the O and U which way it went because the piece of that and then the E and F look like they, they're they supposed to go, like they fit together. I just couldn't figure out which way because it looked like it could fit either way. So I put the F there. So I'm assuming it's syrup of something. So I'm going to put the O and then we're left with the E being under that. So it's syrup of something. I had over here eye pack. So I'm gonna leave that. One thing I'm noticing with how the bottle is shaped, this is like the side of the bottle, a straight corner. So I'm pretty sure I have the I correct. The E just has to go into the middle. Now all I'm missing is a C. So I just Googled, not the answers, but if this is actually a medicine or if I just made up my own medicine. <laughs> syrup of Ipsiac, Ipsiac, Ipsiac. I don't know how to pronounce it, but it is a medicine apparently for something to do with like poisoning or like to help with poisoning and it makes you vomit. Now that brings us back to who lied about their alibi. The one that was vomiting was the professor. Say that the one that was lying about the alibi is Professor Hodges. So now we're gonna go back online to the website and see probably what documents prove the person was lying. That was correct to our bonus envelope B, but it said on the website that that information isn't enough for a conviction. So we have to figure out, find the evidence that proves which suspect killed the Dean. First, we have two things in here, Max and the professor at that restaurant, Shay Lorraine. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, so sorry. There's a letter from Miranda, the ex-fiance, to whom it may concern, I cannot thank you enough for being so instrumental in getting Max Cahill's case reopened. Not a day goes by that I don't wish things had turned out differently between us. Me, if they had, he'd still be alive and we'd be enjoying our children together. I was married when he moved back into town and knew I'd made the greatest mistake of my life the moment I saw him again. As you probably know, my now ex-husband Greg became a prime suspect. I immediately filed for a divorce after the murder. He had such intense hatred for Max. I don't want to think that he killed him. I really don't, but I cannot help feel that it's possible. All the other suspects also had their motivations, so any of them could have done it. P.S. I went through some old things the other day after I heard about the tunnel discovery and found this old picture of Professor Hodges and Max together. Professor Hodges wasn't always very kind to him, but Max always handed it with such poise. He was an amazing person and a true gentleman. It brought a tear to my eye. I thought you might like it too. I feel like there's something in this picture though. This picture is flipped or... It's photos. Something I had noticed was the lapel pins that Max had and then the professor, but I figured that they both had them because I'm assuming that like everyone that works at the university gets them. And then you also see that they're both wearing them in the picture that Miranda had sent in her letter. Saw with these pins is that 
they're different. The one that was found with Max, there's like that green color in technically the right side of this pin. And then this guy has gray in his right side. We have the picture of them. The picture is backwards. It don't really make sense. Name is backwards, but they're inside the restaurant and then the, they're eating inside the restaurant but the name is the right way so that tells me this picture was like horizontally flipped that's on his left then but then he has it on his right the colors are backwards on his pin which i don't know how serious these pins are if they have multiple i don't know what meaning they have somehow i don't know that was complete luck i did say that the professor switched the pins so now we are on our last objective voluntary statement form I am Professor Arthur Hodges, and on the evening of October 26th, I deliberately killed Max Cahill. I must admit, it was brilliantly premeditated, and I take great pleasure in finally divulging the details. Oh my god, this guy is crazy. I knew Max would be working late that night, and he'd be alone as the rest of the faculty were attending a banquet in Atlanta. This provided the perfect opportunity to execute my plan. I needed a good reason for not attending the banquet, as I was to be a keynote speaker. I also needed an alibi. I turned to syrup of... I, the syrup, I don't know how to pronounce it. Administered to those who swallowed something highly unpleasant in order to induce vomiting, and since I'd been swallowing the unpleasant presence of Max Cahill for far too long, it seemed that I should use it in this particular instance. It worked like a charm. Not only was I able to convince everyone of my sickness, I was able to do so by the manner of violent projectile vomiting all over another professor whom I loathed almost as much as I did Max. It was like killing two birds with one stone. I played the part of the ailing stomach bug victim and went home. The effects wore off within the hour as I consumed only the smallest amount necessary to do the job. I rested, regained my composure, then went back to campus. I discovered the secret tunnel about a year before the murder. Quite by accident one day, I noticed the hidden doorway while looking for a book on Davenport's bookshelf. As a distinguished historian, I knew instantly it had to be part of the Underground Railroad. I decided to keep it as my private little find for a while and come out with it officially in a book. It would go down in history as my discovery. I thought of an even better use for that secret entrance. I entered the tunnel by the river, through the hidden bookcase, then made my way into Professor Davenport's office and walked upstairs to the Dean's. With me, I carried an old metal filing tool and a heavy iron ball and chain, both artifacts from the tunnel. Damn, this guy was picking up stuff along the way. I just knew Cahill would be completely captive. He was setting him up like, Hey Max, look at this cool shit I just found. I'm gonna kill you with it. It took him quite by surprise when I walked into his office. He acted worried about me and said I should be home resting. He plays the part of the concerned citizen so well, I said I'd made some discoveries to die for and he couldn't wait. I handed him the file and asked him to read the inscription and while Max was struggling to read the worn down letters that were barely legible, I grabbed the chain, lifted the ball up over my head and came down upon that know-it-all skull of his with full force. He never saw it coming. It made such a nasty sound. I wasn't planning to, but by some stroke of luck, I also managed to break his ostentuous Yale watch in my follow-through. Max was gone, along with all the problems he caused me. I still needed one teeny tiny little thing from him to make it all complete. That lapel pin they gave him when he became Dean. Oh, that's why it, was, that's why it mattered to him. I see. That pin was supposed to be mine, and it signified everything I'd worked so hard for, yet that sniveling little snot snatched it all away from me. There was even an error to it, as it was a mirror image of what everyone else's pin looked like, just like it was an error to give that position to him instead of me. A few weeks later, I was rightfully appointed dean. Back when Max was just a pretentious pupil of mine, he publicly challenged me on a point I'd been teaching about the Underground Railroad and wouldn't let it rest. Ridiculously, he was right. Since he used the Underground Railroad to try to take me down back then, it seemed only befitting and fateful that I should take him down for good with the help of it. If given the chance I would do it all over again, I managed to get away with it for decades, and given my age, they'll most certainly go easy on me in prison. I have to say, though, his premeditation of that was pretty interesting. If you guys were able to figure this out, comment below. If you enjoyed this, let me know. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time.